chapter 2, the end of that chapter. A few weeks ago, we began uh, a new sermon series entitled Pentecost People. We talked about the person and the power of the Holy Spirit and the people that he is creating. And so we're going to continue to look over the next several weeks ahead of us at these people and what characterized their lives. And so we are beginning this morning (coughs) with the first characteristic of those people, that the people of the Spirit, Pentecost people, Christ's people, are repentant people. So first and foremost, happy Father's Day to all of my fathers in the room. God bless you. I'm praying for you as you continue to seek to raise a new generation in Christ. My father... (coughs) has been so instrumental, not only in my faith, but in my life in practical ways. And one of the most practical ways was when I turned 16 and my grandmother let me uh, have and drive her car. I had to learn that being entrusted with this machine was a big responsibility, not only in the sense of driving it, but also in maintaining it. My dad helped me through the years figure different things out. You not only have to put gas in the car, you got to change that oil pretty regularly. You've got to take it to the mechanic and you've got to have regular routine maintenance. And there was one particular point I remember that I I went to him and I said, Dad, there's there's something wrong as I'm driving the car. If I have to take my hands off the steering wheel or or something, the car starts kind of moving. It's drifting to the side a little bit. And dad at that point told me, well, we need to take it in. Your wheels are out of alignment. Just with the wear and tear, the use of a car, many of you might have been in that situation before, you'll notice that there's all of a sudden your car just kind of seems to drift and lean a little bit in one particular direction. Just with the use of the car, maybe with potholes, speed bumps, other obstacles, over time, your wheels have gotten out of alignment And it might seem subtle and annoying at first as you ride down the road, but it eventually is less subtle. And if you don't take care of it, it can lead to major problems for your vehicle. It can put you in danger. Those machines need constant maintenance to remain safe and headed in a safe direction. Our hearts, in a similar way, need regular maintenance. Because there are potholes and speed bumps and other obstacles in the lives that we live. Some of those, most of those, revolve around sin. Either our own or sin committed against us and around us. This world is full of temptations that are vying for our attention as well as our affection. And so we then are prone to wander, to drift away from Christ. And so our hearts also need regular routine maintenance, a refocusing of that attention and affection onto Christ and off of whatever it is that has captured our attention and affection in the moment. That step of faith and obedience is repentance that not only marks the entrance into the Christian life, but should characterize the very way of the Christian life. Because Christ's people are repentant people. Look with me in Acts chapter 2. We'll read just verses 37 and 38 this morning. Peter has just finished preaching. And this is what Luke says. When they heard Peter's message, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Would you pray with me? Father, we are grateful for your grace. We are grateful for your mercy. We are grateful for your patience and your kindness, which is the very thing the Bible tells us leads us to repentance. Lord, I pray that this morning that you would send your Spirit into our hearts and into our minds to realign our attention and our affections onto Jesus, that you would give us a greater understanding and a better relationship with repentance, which can oftentimes seem so intimidating and scary to us. So Lord, I pray today that Jesus, we would make much of you 
that we would magnify and glorify your name and that we would leave this place as people who readily realign our hearts and minds and lives through repentance on a regular basis. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen Amen. and amen. Christ's people are repentant people. Starts right here at the end of Peter's proclamation. If you remember on Pentecost, he was empowered by the Holy Spirit and he preached a very bold in your face gospel presentation as he looked at this crowd and he said, you are the ones who killed the Messiah. And he is now resurrected and on the throne and they were cut to the heart and they cried out, what must we do? And he says, repent. Repentance then shows up throughout the book of Acts in many different sections, in many different passages. And so we're going to look at much of those and from that glean some truths related to repentance. And the very first thing that we need to understand about repentance is that repentance requires belief. You see, it's when they heard Peter's message, they were cut to the heart, they cried out, what shall we do? And Peter's response is repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And throughout the book of Acts, we find Luke repeatedly correlating repentance with the forgiveness of sins. You can see it in Acts chapter 3, 19. Peter there again says to others, repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Acts chapter 5, verse 31, God exalted Christ and at his, at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Luke states this a little bit more positively in Acts chapter 11. When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God saying, then the Gentiles also, to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. See, at first glance, this challenge to repent for faithful evangelicals might be difficult because it's saying repentance is what leads to forgiveness of sins. But as faithful evangelicals, who believe what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, that by grace we've been saved through faith. It's not our own doing, but it's the gift of God, not a result of works. In John 3, 16, which says all who believe in Christ will be saved. And if forgiveness of sins is equated to salvation, we get stuck in this trap that says, well, is, is Luke, who's a close friend and companion of Paul, contradicting Paul? What is it? Is it whoever believes in Jesus is saved and has eternal life? Or is it repentance that leads to eternal life? The answer is yes. It is repentance. It is faith. If you look there in Acts chapter 2, where I have you, look at verse 41. Luke circles back around and he says almost the same things. So those who received Peter's words were baptized and there were added that day about three thousand souls. Just in that same paragraph, Luke goes from repent and receive forgiveness of your sins to those who received his word were baptized. What does it mean that they received his word other than that they believed it? They believed in his word. Sorry, I'm getting a little ahead of myself there. Now repentance leads then, it is a result of faith. Luke connects it in other passages, like 16, verses 30 and 31. He said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Acts chapter 18, verse 18, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord and his entire household and many of the Christians hearing Paul believed and were baptized. Brothers and sisters, the gospel is a message that must be spoken and a message that demands a response. That response, though, only makes sense when the message is first believed. Repentance requires belief. The crowds believed Peter's words and they responded with a heartfelt request and Peter instructed them to repent. Repentance requires belief or said a different way, belief will always result in repentance. Because repentance is defined as a change of heart and mind that leads to a change of behavior. Repentance begins in the heart, but it never stays there. It always finds an outlet 
in our lives. It looks like something. So then what does repentance look like? What does repentance result in? If belief results in repentance, what does repentance result in? Well, first off, repentance results in a turning from sin. Repentance is a change of heart and mind that leads to a change of behavior. Throughout scripture, we are commanded to stop doing certain things. It's Father's Day. And you fathers know the responsibility. You moms know the responsibility too. It's a difficult thing to keep your, your kids safe. And when we are observant and we know that our kids are doing something that is dangerous, it is a heart of love that is going to issue a command that says, stop. A few years ago, Bryant was playing with some friends out on our street and he was racing his bicycle up and down the street. Well, we live on a corner and the corner street that comes by our house is the outlet from our neighborhood. And Bryant was so engaged in his racing of his friend that he blew right through the stop sign and never saw the car that was coming. Praise God, he hit the side of the car and was not injured in anything other than he bent his wheel. But in that moment, as a father, as a parent, you are seeing what your child is not and you scream at the top of your lungs out of love, stop. And it might sound harsh, but it's love. To do anything else is to fall far short of love. And throughout scripture, God is constantly telling his children, stop. Acts chapter 3, 19, repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. What are we commanded to turn back from? We're to turn back from sin. Acts 3 verse 26, God having raised up his servant, sent Christ to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Acts 8 22, repent therefore of this wickedness of yours. The gospel is a call for us to turn away from wickedness, to turn away from sin. Sin, we teach our kids at the smallest age, sin is anything that we think, say, or do that displeases God. Sin is anything that violates or goes against or runs from or rebels from the character of God or rebels against his commands. And that's rooted in many different things. We are called to repent from our wickedness, but elsewhere we're called to repent from false gods and fake beliefs. Acts 19, 26, they are bad-mouthing Paul. And they say this of him, you see in here that not only in Ephesus, but almost, in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people saying that gods made with hands are not gods. The gospel is a call to turn away from false gods that we create for ourselves in our own hearts, in our own lives, and in our culture. It's a call away from false beliefs. It's a turning away from Satan himself. Acts 26 verse 18. To open their, that God is sending Paul to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Turning away from sin is a turning away from darkness and the power of the enemy, the evil one. It's a turning away from sinful practices. In Acts 19, we see what this looks like functionally. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found that it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. Repentance is a turning away from a lifestyle that engages in evil practices. It is a turning away from a lifestyle of sin and rebellion and false beliefs and fake gods. It is a turning away from all of those things that are wicked and wrong. It is hearing the voice of God cry out, this is dangerous, don't go there. Don't be distracted and lulled in by the temptation that this might bring into your life. But repentance is about more than just not doing bad things. My fear is that there are many Christians that would just be content if all of our people would just stop doing bad things and live moral and good lives. But the process of repentance is not just turning away from something. In the act of turning away from something, you must be turning 
to something. So repentance not only results in a turning from sin, it is a turning towards Christ. Because the truth of the matter is, I can turn away from this bad practice into this bad practice. And that's not true biblical repentance. I can turn away from this sin that is worse than this sin. And it's not true repentance. Full biblical repentance is not only a turning from sin, it is a turning to Christ. When we turn from false beliefs and sinful practices, we must turn somewhere. And Acts repeatedly, like a machine gun, hits us with where it is that we are supposed to turn. 935, all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord. Acts eleven twenty one, and the hand of the Lord was with them and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Acts 20, verse 21, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of the repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 26, 18, they came to, oh, that this is again, God giving instructions to Paul to go to Greece, that he is to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in Christ. You see, when we turn away from sin, as I said earlier, it's not as much about what we're turning from, but what we're turning towards and the trajectory of our lives. Biblical repentance is not merely about just not sinning. It's about falling in love with and following after Jesus Christ. And Hebrews chapter 12, the author of Hebrews there says, since, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How? Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. The way that we live the Christian life is by fixing our eyes on Jesus. The way that we leave sin behind is by fixing our eyes on Jesus, by following after Christ, by running after him with all of the strength which we have been given. An old Puritan named Thomas Chalmers wrote a paper called The Expulsive Power of a Greater Affection. I encourage you to go and read it. It's beautiful. And the entire premise of that paper, that sermon that he wrote was this. We can tell someone all day long they need to stop doing something. And we can give them consequences and we can give them warnings and that will never be as powerful as if we give them something better to pursue. If I'm counseling a man or a young teenager and all we do in our accountability times is talk about don't look at porn, don't look at porn, don't look at porn, don't look at porn, what's he thinking about? Porn. What's he going to go running to? Pornography. But if I talk about how amazing Jesus is, if I fix his eyes on Christ who loves him no matter what he's done, if I encourage him to run after Christ with everything that he possibly can, that is what holds the power to break him free from sin. That's what repentance is. Because Jesus is the only one powerful enough to break and beautiful enough to overshadow the hold that sin has on our hearts. So repentance is about falling in love with Christ. It's about running after Christ. It's about growing in a relationship with Christ. It's about un to pursue him with every bit of strength that he has given towards us. And then when we understand it that way, repentance is and it becomes the most fundamental expression of our faith. It's not something that simply characterizes our way into the Christian life. In 1517, Martin Luther wrote 95 theses, 95 challenges to Catholic doctrine. And he nailed them to the door of the Wittenberg church to open a conversation, a theological debate over these issues. His action in that he wrote it in Latin, somebody grabbed it, printed it in German, and it went all over the world in the common tongue. And it launched the Great Reformation. 
Out of those 95 theses, the first three lay the foundation for all of the rest. And those first three are about repentance. This is what they say. Number one, when our Lord Jesus said repent in Matthew 4, 17, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. Two, this word cannot be understand, understood as referring to the sacrament of penance, that is confession and satisfaction as administered by the clergy. Number three, it does not mean, however, solely inner repentance. Such inner repentance is worthless unless it produces various outward mortifications of the flesh. What does that mean? Luther says that repentance is three things. One, it is perpetual. It is not merely the way into the Christian life. Repentance is the way of the Christian life. Because John tells us in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, that every single one of us are sinners. And when we say we have no sin, we make God out to be a liar. You and I will struggle with sin our entire lives. As long as we are in this world, there will be, as I said earlier, temptations, something vying for our attention and for our affection. And therefore, followers of Jesus Christ are the people who have not only repented once, but are the people who are constantly repenting, constantly turning away from temptation and sin and turning towards Christ and who do it quickly. The sign of true Christian maturity, brothers and sisters, is not a stopping of sin. We will always sin in many different ways. The sign of true biblical Christian maturity is the length of time between when I sin and when I repent gets shorter. I don't wait a week and a half to deal with a sin in my life. I deal with it instantly. That's the sign of true Christian maturity and growth. But Luther's first point is not only that it's perpetual, sin is personal. Oh no, repentance is personal. And that's not to say that we're supposed to struggle through our sin alone. Because James tells us in chapter five, verse 16, that if we confess our sins to one another and pray for one another, we'll be healed. We receive forgiveness of our sins when we confess it to God. We find freedom and healing and help when we confess it to one another and bear one another's burdens. What Luther is saying though, is that I as a pastor and no priest have the authority from God to absolve you of your sin. Jesus Christ alone forgives you of your sin. No amount of self-deprecation, self-hatred, and self-harm, no amount of self-discipline will absolve you of your sin, forgive you of your sin. Christ and Christ alone has paid the price for your sin in full. The call for you and for me is to believe that. Repentance requires belief. To believe that my sin is paid for in Jesus and receive then his love. But repentance is also, not only is it perpetual, ongoing for the Christian, not only is it personal, your trust in your relationship with Jesus Christ, it is perceivable. Faith kind of has three components. HBO, hearing, believing, and obeying. James tells us if we have faith that never shows up in our lives, that faith is not real. And Luke actually says this in Luke, Acts 26. He says there was a command that they should repent there at the end of the verse and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. Brothers and sisters, repentance looks like something. You know, it's easy for us to come to church and hear a sermon or hear a message or hear a Bible study that pricks our hearts and we have our own little private moment with Jesus right here that says, okay, Jesus, I'm coming to you one more time, one more time and I ask you to forgive me. But then we walk out that door and it makes no difference in our lives. We take no realistic measurable step towards Jesus except for this interpersonal moment right here, which is crucial, which is important but there must be something that happens then in our lives. A belief that doesn't change our behavior is not a belief at all. And Jesus Christ doesn't merely require our heart and our head. He requires your life. In the big stuff and the small steps, Jesus demands all of you and all of me. Christ's people are repentant people. 
Just like safe driving is active driving. It is being aware of who you are, where you are, what you're doing. It's being aware of what's going on in your car. Because any subtle drift, if your wheels are out of alignment, even just a little bit right here, it may not be dangerous in the moment, but if left unchecked, being off just a half of a degree, if left unchecked, will end up in a ditch somewhere down the road. Brothers and sisters, so often we hear repentance defined as this massive 180 degree turn away from this and towards this. My fear is that when we define it that way, what we end up doing is we put repentance in a box for the unsaved who have to turn from a lifestyle of sin and to Jesus or for only when I have some big sin, some life dominating sin, something that is atrocious, that that's when I repent. But a plane that is off by just a degree here looks like it's parallel with a plane that's on course for a little while. But when you go out hours and hundreds and thousands of miles, that minuscule little mishap in the instrumentation means missing your destination by thousands of miles. Brothers and sisters, there are men and women and children in churches that look like they are walking the path of freedom, but might be off by just a millimeter of a degree. Repentance is not merely about a 180 degree. It's just a realignment turning from this to Jesus, from this practice to Christ, from this false belief to the truth. And that is something that happens every moment of every day in your life and in my life as the Spirit speaks to us and calls us back to Christ. Repentance is basic. Repentance is subtle. Repentance is beautiful. And it is the way that you and I regularly maintain our hearts. Because we know what the hymn writer wrote is true. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let your grace, Lord, like a fetter, like a chain, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. So here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for your courts above. Brothers and sisters, we are living lives that are full of temptation that would cause us to drift off course from Jesus. The way back is the same as the way in. Repent. Return. Refocus realign yourselves and receive the grace and the mercy and the love of God. So my question to you is, what does repentance look like to, for you today? Maybe it starts with a belief. Maybe you need to shift your thinking on what repentance is. Maybe you need to change your lifestyle by taking a step of obedience because repentance is a turning from sin, turning to Christ, and that looks like something. So in what ways do you need to redirect the trajectory of your life towards Jesus today and this week? I invite you, if you would, would you take, your heart, or take a moment and bow your heads and open your hearts in prayer? Would you go before the Lord and would you just ask him that question? God, what should repentance look like for me? And I'll close this in a moment. Holy Spirit, you are the one who pricks our hearts and leads us towards the heart of Christ. Jesus said, how is it that we might know a man, but a spirit knows the heart of a man just as the Holy Spirit knows the heart of the Father. And so, Spirit, you get to be our friend. You are our friend, our comforter, our guide. 
And because of your presence there on that day in Pentecost, you used the word to pierce the hearts of the crowd. And they cried out and they said, what should we do? Lord, I'm here right now, Holy Spirit, I'm before you and I'm asking in my own heart, what can I do? What must I do? What subtle change, what massive change in my thinking, in my believing, in my life, what needs to be readjusted and realigned today that I might walk in step with the Spirit, that I might walk in fellowship with my Father, that I might be free of the weight and sin because I am running after Jesus. Would you show us today the way that we can respond? that we might make much of Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. In a moment, I'm gonna invite you to stand and I'm gonna invite you to respond as the Lord so leads. If you need that private moment with the Lord and you wanna come and you wanna lay your heart bare before him because there's something going on in your life, a sin that has dominated and struggled with you and you are like I was in high school, that kid that continued to show up Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, ringing on the back of the pew saying, God, here I am again and I'm so embarrassed and I'm so ashamed because I'm here one more time asking for forgiveness for the same sin. You don't have to stay there alone. It was only when I reached out and I asked mentors and others for help that I had people who came alongside me, who encouraged me, who discipled me out of sin. Maybe what you need today is you need to take the step of obedience that is a step of trust that we are not going to kick you to the curb. When you come and you share whatever it is that brings so much guilt and shame to bear on your soul. And you need to experience that freedom that not only is promised in Jesus Christ, but comes because you have received the love of a family of God. I invite you to come, but maybe you're here this morning and there's never been a time in your life that you have turned from your fake gods and your false beliefs to trust in Jesus. The one who has promised you the forgiveness of your sins, if you would just look to him and choose him. I invite you to come. Come forward. We'll have deacons. I'll be waiting here at the front. I'd love to talk with you about a life in Jesus Christ. Freedom that comes in him. Not only for heaven, but for tomorrow and this afternoon. Maybe you're here this morning and you know what? You don't have a great relationship with your father. And your father has done things in your life that drives you away from God instead of to him. And let me say, I am so, so sorry that that is your experience. The father that we worship is the perfect father. And even the greatest father that has ever lived on this planet falls infinitely short of how much and how great and how beautiful and how wonderful he is. Would you come to him today? and experience the father who runs to his children and never from them. Would you stand and would you respond as the Lord so leads?
Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was Amen. I pray that you've been encouraged. The Christian life is a beautiful life. A life lived in love with Jesus. And every day we get the chance to choose him again. To not choose to go my own way. To choose Christ. To realign my heart and my focus on him. And so I pray that you've been encouraged with that. If you want to have a seat for just one quick second, we've got a video that we'd love for you to see. And then I'll share an announcement and then we will be dismissed. So if you would watch this with me. So last week we shared with you a little bit about an opportunity that we're going to engage in uh, at the end, near the end of the year, around October. And so this was a little bit more, if you weren't familiar with the process of Judgment House, what it is. Uh, it is a dramatic presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and uh, to the community. And it is a, a good way not only for us to present the gospel, but to come together as a church body. So in the multiple steps that were presented there, we're at the step where we're reaching out to the church to say, we can't do this without you. We we have a faithful team that has been meeting and praying and planning. Uh, and they have gotten a script. And so they are now asking you to be prayerfully considering the ways that you could help. And there are a number of different ways that you can serve. And so next Sunday evening at what time? 
Five o'clock. Uh, at five o'clock, we're going to have another interest meeting where we are going to share with you all of the different ways from acting to parking lot attendants to prayer warriors to counselors and guides and the many different ways that you can participate. And so that will be next Sunday evening at five. And we invite you to be prayerfully considering the ways that you can participate in that. Uh, share with your family, with your friends and others, because we would love to partner with other churches. Again, I pray that you have been blessed this morning and that you will go in that and be a blessing this week. So we invite you to stick around for Sunday school, and we hope that you will join us there. We have classes of all ages, and that begins in five minutes. God bless you. We'll see you in Sunday school.